The war unleashed by Russia against Ukraine will soon go into a frozen state, regardless of the wishes of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Russia does not have the resources to continue it. Putin's ally, former Odessa City Council deputy and collaborator Igor Dmitriev, wrote about this openly in Telegram. He claims that the freezing of the war will happen on its own, regardless of the desires or ambitions in the Kremlin or on Bankova. The fact is that Russia has exhausted the resources to continue its aggression. Ukraine is also seriously exhausted. The current situation can be described by a simple formula. There is nothing to attack with, no one to defend with. Russia does not have the material resources to attack, Dmitriev said. He clarified that the Kremlin is not ready for a total mobilization of society and the economy. The traitor who helped Russia in its aggression against Ukraine now calls the so-called SVO a mistake. This war was a mistake, and it will be taken out of the spotlight and eventually forgotten, the collaborator said. He said that Russia really wants to end the war against Ukraine, but it can't do it. Beautifully, each new move only worsens the aggressor's position. He claims that negotiations on ending the war between Ukraine and the Russian Federation have been going on since the very beginning. Already in the first days of the so-called SVO, Moscow realized that it had failed and tried to persuade Kiev to capitulate through negotiations. Nothing good came of it. From the very first days, it was clear that nothing good was in the cards. They wanted to fly in for free, but it didn't work out. And then the wave of problems and losses only grew. They decided to pile on with everything they had to scare. It didn't work out. To include four regions of Ukraine into the Russian Federation, now there are only problems with this, said Dmitriev. He stressed that Russia has not been able to achieve a radical change in the situation at the front in two and a half years and apparently will not be able to do so. Meanwhile, Western sanctions are gradually undermining the Russian economy. And now the Russian Federation has found itself in a trap that it has driven itself into. No one in the Kremlin knows how to get out of this situation. Although in private conversations, everyone is actively advocating for the earliest possible end to the SVO. How to get out? It's not clear. At the very beginning of the war, it was possible to pretend that it hadn't started yet. But then we weren't ready to soberly assess the situation. Now, in personal conversations, many admit that it's really necessary to finish. But there are no options for doing it beautifully. Dmitriev stated, One day after the U.S. said 3,000 North Korean troops have been deployed to Russia and warned that those forces will be fair game if they go into combat in Ukraine, the Pentagon slammed Russian President Vladimir Putin, suggesting the move is one of desperation. Vladimir Putin has become so desperate that he is now willing and soliciting, you know, potentially support from the DPRK to put there their personnel on the battlefield, said Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh. Russian lawmakers ratified a pact with North Korea envisioning mutual military assistance. The lower house of the Russian parliament, the State Duma, voted quickly to endorse the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty that Russia's President Vladimir Putin signed with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on a visit to Pyongyang in June. The upper house is expected to follow suit soon. The pact obliges Russia and North Korea to immediately provide military assistance using all means if either is attacked. It marked the strongest link between Moscow and Pyongyang since the end of the Cold War. If the DPRK soldiers enter into combat, they would be co-belligerents, Singh said. And that is a very serious issue. The Pentagon also weighed in on the humanitarian situation in Gaza as Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveled to Doha to meet with Qatari officials, who have been key mediators in the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. continues to struggle to break the logjam of ceasefire negotiations between Israel and the militant group. The humanitarian situation is as dire, Singh said. So we know that a ceasefire would be the best way to get, whether it be food, water, humanitarian needs in, as well as medical treatment, into Gaza. Finally, 
Singh said U.S. troops participated in an Iraqi-led operation against ISIS fighters in the Anbar province in Iraq. The Pentagon is evaluating the operation and was not aware of any U.S. casualties in the operation. Singh also provided an update on a joint raid by U.S. and Iraqi troops earlier this week that killed more than half a dozen Islamic State leaders in Iraq, but also left two U.S. troops injured. Singh said the two U.S. troops are in stable condition and will get follow-on care at Walter Reed National Military Center outside of Washington, D.C. She also said a third American service member is being evaluated for TBI. This really highlights Russia's desperation, um, you know, tin cupping to the DPRK, to Iran, um, enticing DPRK soldiers, you know, if, if they were to ever enter the fight. Um, I think that shows that Putin has failed in his strategic objectives on the battlefield. Returned yesterday from a busy week of travel. A summary of Vladimir Putin has become so desperate that he is now willing and, and soliciting, um, you know, potentially support from the DPRK to put their, their personnel on the battlefield. Um, and, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, over 500,000 um, casualties that, you know, Russia has experienced on the battlefield. Um, so if the DPRK soldiers enter into combat, um, they would be co-belligerents, and that is a very serious issue. Um, but it's not a it's you know it's something that we're you know aware of this relationship we're going to continue to monitor um and um i think again the important point here is that it really highlights putin's desperation um, because he has really failed to meet his strategic objectives on the battlefield you know the humanitarian situation is is dire um so we know that a ceasefire would be the best way to get whether it be food, water, you know, humanitarian needs in, um, as well as medical treatment into into Gaza. Um, we also know that you know Israel has been effective um, in really dismantling Hamas in Gaza. Hamas, you know, cannot conduct the type of um, attack that they conducted on October seventh today. They just don't. They they have been. Um, dismantled into a way where they are not that, that same organization pre-October 7th. Um, we have also urged, you know, Sinwar's death is an opportunity. Um, let's use it. So again, you're seeing Secretary Blinken in the region. Um, I don't have more to add to his comments, but we certainly haven't given up hope. Um, it's something that this administration is going to continue to push for. With his NATO counterparts in Brussels. And, a and earlier today, U.S. forces participated in an Iraqi-led operation against ISIS fighters in the Anbar province in Iraq. Our assessment of the operation is still ongoing, and to my knowledge, there were no U.S. personnel injured in the operation. Additionally, I have an update on the two service members wounded in a partnered raid with Iraqi security forces on October 22nd. Earlier this week, the ISF, enabled by personnel from CJTF OIR, conducted strikes and follow-on raids on multiple ISIS locations in central Iraq, targeting several senior ISIS leaders and killing at least seven ISIS operatives. During the operation, two U.S. military personnel were wounded by an explosion while assisting Iraqi forces with site exploitation. While both service members sustained serious injuries, they are in stable condition and are currently en route to Walter Reed Medical Center for follow-on care. Additionally, we recently learned a third service member is being assessed for potential TBI. And as you know, TBI numbers can fluctuate over time. All are in stable condition and receiving the care that they need.